The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, so let's uh, get started. Uh, a recap. You should be all pleased you have learned a lot. Uh, we covered uh, uh, the quantum, solid state, and the statistical physics uh, in this is my lecture 11. Okay. And so what we learned, uh, first, the quantum and the solid state gives us the energy levels and the energy state. What is the quantum state? And statistics give us at the equilibrium, each quantum state, how many particles, uh, photons, electrons, photons. And going back to counting the state, degeneracy, we get the density of states. So at a certain energy level per unit energy interval or per unit we vector how many uh, quantum states we have. So with that, uh, we, you can do the counting. And uh, uh, this is a F times D gives me a number of particles near that energy per energy interval. If you integrate, that should give you the total number of particles, electrons, photons, photons. Or if you multiply by the energy of a particle, that gives you the energy. Or if you multiply by charge, give you the charge density, if you uh, multiply by the momentum, gives you momentum, right? So with that, you can start doing uh, the, uh, for example, the energy stored, specific heat, etc. And then uh, we said that at the end of the last lecture, we're moving on to look at the transport. And the first idea we, we look at is, if I want to find out how much energy is going from point one to point two into different space. And uh, what I, I'm going to find out uh, is uh, what's the transmittance. So if I have a particle or wave, now I don't know how to call them, right? It's particle wave duality. And I uh, say so if I have a, a, a carrier, right? Electron, photon, photon launch from point one. And the transmittance is how much uh, how many of them will reach point two? Right? That's to give me the uh, fraction. Right? And then say, uh, if I know the velocity, then I know the flux from point one to point two, which is the velocity in that direction, transmittance. And if I want to find the energy flux, that's per, uh, say, uh, this is how much energy I have starting from that point. Right? So, uh, this is where we're going. Uh, in the uh, coming chapter, we're going to focus on using the wave picture to deal with this transmittance. And then, if I want to find the left flux, if you recall in chapter one, when we derive Fourier law, we say it's from one to two and minus two to one. The difference give me the left flux. Right. So, uh, what uh, uh, we're emphasizing so far is you know how to do the counting. And uh, our focus in this chapter is talking about the wave picture. Right? We've been uh, using the wave, a Schrodinger equation for atoms, electrons, and all our wave picture. And uh, uh, if, why we have to look at the wave? And this is important if I deal with the interface. Because uh, I mentioned before, um, idea interface is zero thickness, right? Is compared to wavelengths. If that uh, say very small compared to wavelengths, then I should use the wave picture. Uh, so here is the magnitude, order of magnitude of this wavelengths, right? Black body radiation, winds dis displacement, or say wavelengths times temperature is about 3,000 micron Kelvin. So at room temperature, that's 10 micron. It's a very large distance, uh, 10 micron. Uh, uh, compared to a zero thickness interface, right? So if I have a, a flat interface, I need to consider the wave optics. So for uh, for uh, for even for thermal radiation, and uh, electrons, 
Uh, here are two different pictures. If I look at the electron in metal, the Fermi level is within the band. And corresponding to this Fermi level, those are the electron that moves. Near Fermi level are the electron that moves, right? And the corresponding wavelength is within the bands, right? This is zero, this is pi over a, bring on its own. So if it's half, that's a wavelength is about 2a. OK? Uh, or say of the order of a few lattice constant, that's the electron wavelength in metal there. And if I look at the semiconductors, right? Uh, if I say this is a valence band, and most of the electron is at bottom of the valence band. So that's a layer k equals 0. And those wave uh, electrons could have very long wavelengths. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, say in the last lecture, we talked about the De Broglie wavelength. So that's the thermal, if I have a thermal energy, kT of the, say, average energy is kT of the electron kinetic energy. What's the corresponding wavelength? That's the De Broglie wavelength, right? So the last lecture, we got the h square and 2 pi mkBT. So if I substitute my numbers, this is h is 6.6 .6, 10 to the minus 34 jar second, right? This is h. And uh, in the denominator, I have 2 pi. If I think about the electron, electron mass, right? Line point 0.1, 10 to the minus 31. And kB is 1.38, 10 to the minus 23. And 300 Kelvin, square root. You go to do that, you get this number. I get about 40 Armstrong. So it gives you the sort of average wavelength of those electrons with that energy kT near the bottom of the conduction band. Right? So again, uh, uh, this is 40, 40 uh, Armstrong seems awfully small. But we said before, the uh, sharp interface is zero thickness. And in fact, you can deposit the layers almost atomically flat. Right? So <coughs> I again, say, uh, if in those cases, you should consider uh, the wave reflection transmission just as the optical waves. And phonons, this is the dispersion we uh, learned before, typical one. And uh, of course, at the zone boundary, the wavelength is 2a, right? And it go, goes for a very long wavelength. So this is a, uh, the sound waves. If you have a solid, they lock it, you'll hear it. It's a very long wavelength at the zone center to the whole, just a 2a in between the lattice constant, right? And if you do your, uh, uh, like the black body for full long, uh, you do your density of states. Uh, uh, you remember when we do black body radiation, we do energy of a photon times the substrates times the Bose Einstein distribution. That's how we get black body radiation. And then you do the same for photon, you'll say it's similar to black body this spectrum, except that you're cut off. You have a cut off wavelength because it's unlike electromagnetic wave in free space, uh, uh, that, that one goes very small. Right, so the lattice constant, 2a lattice constant. So overall, uh, it's good if we start with the thinking, uh, when I calculate the transmission, next that I will consider one single interface. If I have one, two, and I have those waves, this could be uh, electron wave, could be photon wave, and could be photon wave comes to the interface, and they will be reflected. And they will also be, could be transmitting across the interface. How much, how I can calculate how much is reflected, how much is transmitted, right? So that's uh, uh, my first order uh, of business. And that will give me the transmission from one side of interface to the other side of interface, right? And of course, <coughs> I could have uh, layers, or I could have uh, many layers, right? This is, I'm, I'm considering really a planar geometry, make a 1D problem simpler, right? So in this case, one and two and three will have multi-layers coding when I use optical coatings, 
right? How I will calculate the transmission and reflection. And turns out the waves are very similar. Whether it's an electron wave, a phonon wave, or electromagnetic wave, you will see the behavior are very similar, although at the quantum level, uh, we know that electron, phonon, photons are different, right? But the general way we behavior in terms of interference, in terms of diffraction, in terms of tunneling, all those exist for all waves. And uh, uh, there are different technologies developed based on this phenomenon. So let's uh, uh, look at, start with the plane wave at a one interface, right? Let's just consider the simplest plane wave. And uh, the reflection, reflection at the interface. You can see here, I'm not even distinguishing whether it's electron, electromagnetic, although my detailed derivation will have to write, start with different wave equations, right? And in this case, I want to actually start with a quantum wave, or electron. And that's because uh, that's the simplest. Electron, if you think about Schrodinger equation, in certain sense, it's simple because it's scalar. The wave function is scalar. It's a lot of vector. When I go to acoustic waves, right, the lattice vibration, there are three polarizing, two transverse, one non-children. Electromagnetic wave, it's a vector wave. The electric field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. There are two polarization. So uh, I will start with the simplest uh, electron wave. It's a scalar. Right, and we uh, have done uh, the electron wave Schrodinger equation before, 2m d psi. I said, let me think about the one electron, 1d dx squared, plus u minus e. This is the steady state part, right? u minus e, u is the potential, e is the electron energy. And of course, there is a time dependent part. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, remember, the time dependent part is just an uh, uh, exponential mass i omega t, or this omega equals e over h bar. That's the Planck relation. Right? And uh, for this way, we solved the before. It's a simple second order differential equation with constant coefficient. So we solved this before, and then let me write it down. The general waveform, as a, if I combine the time and the space dependent all together, that looks more like a wave, plan wave i omega t minus k um, x plus b e my, uh, minus i omega t plus k x. I have two solutions. Right? That's what we've written down before. Now, you can tell me the first solution is the wave propagating in which direction? Positive x. Second wave is the negative x direction, right? Those are the two counter propagating waves, and it's the superposition of two waves. Now I'm going to look at the, uh, if I deposit a film with the interface, right? So this interface, I look at the 1D. Uh, so forget about the, say, YZ direction. And uh, so 1D interface, this is uh, one side of the film. This is the other side of the film. And uh, uh, this is a typically, if you put a two different semiconductors together, right? And here is a conduction band EC1. Here is a conduction band EC2. Right? So EC1, EC2. And at the interface, there's a, a discontinuity of the energy of the electrons. Right? And the difference here is U, or delta. The different places have different symbols. And this is a typically called a heterojunction. 
when I put uh, two different conductors together, semiconductor together, at the interface, there's a potential barrier, electrical potential barrier. And the detail is more complicated than, than I draw. I draw a sharp one. And in fact, the electron here is not stable. It's going to fall into here. So it's not going to be a flat as a flat as I'm drawing here. Here's a very simple approximation. OK? And now I have an electron wave comes in. So I can take a form of the incident wave. And if this is uh, my x direction, at the, at the interface, there will be reflection. The wave will go back. Right? On the other side, there could be transmission. The wave can go over the barrier, continue. Right? So I have reflection, I have transmission. I want to find how much is reflected, how much is transmitted. OK. So here, you can use the plane wave solution. For medium 1, let me take this. Uh, uh, U as a reference, this is zero. Here is a, uh, so electron here experience a difference between zero and magnitude U. Right? So because of this, my K in each region, you see in region, let's say here is my zero uh, origin of my coordinate, and you can always take your origin. But typically, it's much easier if you set the origin at the interface, at least at the first interface. If you have multi layers, you have to continue because there's distance from 0, so you count that distance. Right? So if I put this one at 0, I have an incident wave psi i. Right? This is the incident. And it has an amplitude a. And going to the right hand side, so exponential mass i, omega t minus k1x, because this is region 1, and this is region 2. Right? My k is different, because here, k, my k, if you look at this, is 2m e minus u divided by uh, h bar squared. You combine this together and uh, reverse the sign e minus u, not u minus e. OK? So uh, in this region, u equals 0. So whatever energy e of the electron, mass potential 0. So that's the waveform, the wave vector of k1. Right? And uh, they reflect it. Here, psi, this one, this is reflective wave. You can see the reflective wave is going backward, right? My coefficient is on, on B, I say. I want to find out the, the reflection A and the B relation. My transmitted wave in region 2, so if I write down the transmitted wave, is a say exponential. Again, it's forward propagating into x direction, positive x direction. Right? So it's the same mass i omega t mass k2x, not k1x. And this k2, you can say, is a 2 uh, m e mass u now, h squared. And the k1 is just uh, u is 0, so it's 2 m e is the energy of the electron. 2m over e, uh, 2m e over h squared, right? So this is the difference of these waves. Here in region one, they reflect incident reflected. They differ only by here is a plus, here is a minus. Coefficients of the course are different, and transmitted wave in region two is the coefficient is different. Wave vector is different. Two difference, right? So I want to find out relation between one and two. And uh, my, to find those relations, I have to use the, continue, the interface condition. Right? At the interface, the wave function is continuous. The derivative of the wave function is continuous. So uh, the wave function, 
So it's not just a one wave function. When I say wave function, it's all the waves, all the, you add them all together. Right? You add the waves together. And uh, so either the uh, x squared 0, what I have is a psi i plus psi r. On the left hand side, I have two waves, incident reflected. Right? x squared to 0 equals psi t x squared to 0. What I get? So the incident is a uh, x squared to 0, so k1 x, that's 0. Uh, minus i omega t is shared the same. Omega is the energy of the, of the particle, right? E divided by h is the same on both sides. So when you go, the wave go from one media into the other media, the frequency doesn't change. Okay? And uh, so what I have here is really A plus B equals C. Right? Because E minus I omega T, E minus I omega T, and Poseidon T is E minus I omega T, that all cancel. Right? X equals zero. So I have that. My second condition is a derivative. So it's a total derivative of all the waves and because of summation, so I put each one. So I first take derivative. You have to be careful. You first take derivative, you set x equal to, equal to 0. And this equals derivative x equal to 0. So if you take a derivative, so you say with respect to x, so this is a i k, right? Negative, negative, so I have Positive i k1 a, that's the first term. That's the incident. Reflected is b, and here is mass i times plus k. So I have a sign change after I take derivative, right? So a must be equals i k2 times c. So that's the application of the two boundary conditions. Yes, Ron? If you were to tailor the different refractive indices, would the frequency change as the wave goes through, or just the... No, the frequency doesn't change. Oh, okay. Right. When you have, your, you have light goes from one media into another media, the frequency does not change. The wavelengths change. OK? So this is a case my... You remember HK gives me momentum. P equals HK over... Uh, uh, say uh, h bar or lambda give me the momentum, right? So uh, here is my uh, two conditions, and I want to find the ratio because I want to find transmission is c over a, reflection is b over a. So I have two equations. I want to find the ratio. I can find those ratios, and the ratio I have is so based on this, I have a c over a is. Uh, 2 k1, k1 plus k2, and the b over a is k1 minus k2, uh, k1 plus k2. So those are my uh, solutions for the coefficients uh, for the transmitted wave and reflected wave relative to the incident wave, right? But what does this coefficient really doesn't mean anything yet? Because we said before the wave function is not a measurable quantity, right? In quantum is the psi times psi complex conjugate that gives the particles, right? And uh, the particle flux in quantum Right? The flux of the particle, uh, we give this expression before, is uh, uh, in the vector form, is the i h bar 2m and uh, psi complex conjugate of uh, gradient of psi and uh, psi complex conjugate times gradient of psi. 
So that's the particle flux. And uh, another way to write this, if you, uh, if you uh, use a shorthand, this is a real part of uh, I h bar and uh, m psi complex conjugate of uh, gradient. Because this one is complex conjugate of this one. So the difference gives uh, uh, overall is, uh, is the real part of this. Okay. And now I'm going to plug in, because I want to say what's my, for example, if I my incident, if psi is my psi i, right? You say psi i is a exponential minus i omega t minus kx. OK, so let's substitute in. So in this case, the incident flux is a real part of i h bar to m psi is a exponential minus i omega t minus k 1 x. That's the incident. So the derivative is d psi. I first take complex conjugate, and then I take the derivative. And complex conjugate, this one becomes plus, because of i, right? Minus i becomes plus i. And k1, I'm going to take a more uniform, I see it's complex, because uh, omega is a frequency. Wave vector, I'm going to also say it could be real and imaginary or complex number. I treat it. So in that case, I have, if I take a derivative, I should have plus, that's i, and this uh, is uh, times mass complex conjugate k1 and exponential plus omega t minus k1 x. And uh, right? So oh, I have an A. I should have an A here. A complex conjugate. OK. And uh, mass i omega t plus i omega t cancel. Time is not there, right? And uh, I k uh, k one x uh, plus I k one x. Uh, oh, here I should be complex conjugate in general, right? Because I t first take a complex conjugate of this function. And uh, uh, so in general, this one may not be zero because this k one and plus k complex conjugate they may not cancel if it's an imaginary number, right? For my case here, because uh, in region 1, u is 0, so this one is real. Doesn't matter. And also, either x equals 0, right? This also goes out. So at the end, uh, is j, at least I can say at the x equals 0, you can say this is a, a square, a times a complex conjugate, i times i is a negative 1, another negative, right? So that's a positive. So I really have this i, this i cancel. I have uh, a, m, h, and k1. So g1 equals h, m, and uh, k1, a square. Okay, so this is my particle flux, incident flux, and uh, similarly, the reflective flux is also if you substitute in, it's the same as uh, h k one uh, m b square, right? But the transmitted flux, I have to be careful. Okay, the reason I have to be careful is. You can say my solution, if energy is less than u, k2 is imaginary. OK? So in that case, I have to be really carrying that real part of k2 uh, complex conjugate. Because this is a complex conjugate k2 and the real part of that. 
that's where I have to be careful. OK. So based on this, I will define the uh, reflectance and transmittance Sometimes I use reflectivity. Sometimes I use reflectance. And the difference is um, some people, most people don't distinguish it. Uh, reflectivity is more intrinsic. So if you have most ideas case, that's an intrinsic surface property. And reflectance is uh, extrinsic. If your surface become changed or rough, well, then there's a different value. So this is a, a more rigorous uh, way of calling it. But uh, you can, most of the time, people don't care. So reflectivity, for here I have an idea, is JR divided by JI. And because K1 cancel in the same media, so reflected, transmitted, so it really just has B squared over A squared. And b squared over a squared, if you say b over a, so I have k1 minus k2 and k1 plus k2 squared. So that's the reflectance at the interface for a particle wave due to quantum reflection. Right? And transmittance. or transmittivity and there's also transmittance and uh, in the transmittance I use uh, tau equals jt over ji and uh, here it's different because the J transmitted is a real part of K2 complex conjugate over K1 is real anyway. And uh, 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 here I have uh, C square over A square. And this is a real part of K2 uh, complex conjugate K1. And C square uh, over A square, uh, you can say it is K1 plus K2 and uh, 2 K1 square. Right? That's my transmittance. OK. Now, because I carry this real part, right? I should really look at uh, the scenario, different scenario, when energy is larger than U. If energy is larger than U, K2 is comp uh, K2, if you look at the K2, is 2m e minus U, that's real. Right? The energy of the electron is larger than the barrier height, that's real. OK? And in that is K is real, so it's, I can forget about this. You can see this becomes a 4 K1 times K2 divided by K1 plus K2 squared. OK? So in this case, I have a tau uh, is not 0, but they uh, say R is not 1. Right? I have quantum reflection. Even I threw an electron, even, even you normally think an electron as a particle, when it comes to an interface, it has reflection. Right? Even if the energy is higher than the barrier height. So now you just say, next time you throw a wall, throw a ball over the wall, there's a final probability bounce back, even you threw the higher than the wall. It's quantum war, right? OK? And uh, uh, so that's your first uh, uh, case. And uh, your second case is E less than U, right? E is less than U. If you look at the here, your K2 is imaginary, right? K2 is imaginary, 
and uh, the real part that's zero. So if the energy of the electron is less than the barrier height U, your transmittance is zero, and your reflectance, if you plug in here, this is real, this is imaginary, this is real, this is imaginary, the modulus is one. Right? So reflectance is one. So the particle is all reflected. It's expected, right? You threw a ball uh, below the wall, the particle, the wall, the ball, the ball bounced back. But there's still something special. Okay? You look at the other side of the wall, the ball, uh, the wall there is a finite wave of the wall, of the ball. Right? That's because if you look at the transmitter, so also the transmitter, there's no real particle go through the wall, the barrier, right? But the wave is not zero because here, this is my wave. Phi t mass i omega t, k2 is imaginary, right? k2 is imaginary, so imaginary times imaginary, real. It's a negative real. So it's a negative exponential decay function. So in this case, what I have is this is the uh, a ball coming in, the particle comes in, and uh, there is a finite wave on the other side of the interface. The, time, the average speaking, there's no particle go into the other side, but the wave function is not zero on the other side, right? And this wave is called the evanescent wave. Evanescent. Okay. And uh, now, what's the magnitude of those? Right. So if you look at your decay of this evanescent wave, if you look at decay of evanescent wave, is really the magnitude of the E minus U 2M H bar square. That's the square root. This is really the magnitude. So what I have here, the, mag the magnitude of K is 2M uh, really E minus U and h bar squared, that's by with, uh, the k2. That's the decay, right? Or u minus e, right? So if I look at the electron u minus e, let's say take a one, volt, a one electron volt. So the energy, so what's the order of magnitude? Is a 2 times 9.1, 10 to the minus 31. And uh, uh, electron volts. One electron volts is uh, uh, 1.6, 10 to the minus 19. And uh, h bar square, h bar is uh, uh, 1, 10 to the minus 34, so 68, right? So this one is 31, 19 gives me 50, right? And uh, uh, this gives me 68, so that's 18. 18 square root is of the order of line, right? And the rest is OK. Here, maybe I have 5 order of line inverse meter. OK? So that's the magnitude of this wave extend if it's an electron into the other side. It's of the order inverse of that, gives me what, two Armstrongs, right? So it's a, a evanescent rapid decay, exponential rapid decay wave on the other side. You so say, who cares two Armstrongs, right? But let me tell you the story. So um, there was this guy. Um, he just finished his PhD and uh, went to a job interview at IBM Zurich. and. Uh, uh, his name is Binish, and the interviewer um, uh, asked him, say, they want to measure the surface roughness. 
of uh, uh, say uh, uh, to very high precision, asking him whether he had ideas or not. And uh, he thought about this and came up with the idea that's using a metal tip. And this is a metal surface, right? And uh, he put a bias. So vacuum here, there's an energy level. That's a, you read the Einstein work function. Uh, maybe you didn't read the, you read the, the nature, the wave nature, the, the particle nature of light. But say there is a few electron volts gap here, the barrier, vacuum, right? Work function of metal. So here is a few electron volts. And he say if you bias it with the voltage, right? The electron exponential decay, but once they meet the other metal, become alive again. We'll, we'll talk about that. That's the tunneling of this evanescent wave. And it's a very sensitive to atomic scale bumpy, bumpless, right? Because this is unstrong level exponential. So with that, you can measure. To, that's the principle of scanning tunnel microscope. You really can measure the electron wave function on the surface. So you can actually image atoms. And so he got a Robert Prize for that. Okay. Hopefully you'll get a chance when you have an interview like that. <laughs> you have to think. You have to be able to come up with the idea, right? So uh, that's the, the quantum world. It's going up a hill. Now you reverse it. You say, what if my electron is going backwards? From here to here. Is there a reflection? You look at the derivation, there's no difference. Even you go downhill, even if you not go barrier, you go a step down, you still have a reflection. Right? You have discontinuity in potential, you have reflection there. Okay. So uh, this is the, in fact, this is a Lohmer incidence, right? And uh, when you consider actually electrical interface resistance, for example, right, electron can actually come to an interface not just a Lohmer, it can, can come from uh, all directions. And uh, you should be able to sit there and do any angle in incidence. Right? In fact, I checked a lot of electrical engineering book. Nobody even did that. I was surprised. Okay, if you're an electrical engineer, you should do this. Okay. So this is uh, uh, for electron wave. And uh, now let's go. We say this is scalar uh, uh, wave. It's the easiest. And let's go to more complicated. And uh, let's look at the vector wave. And uh, um, vector wave, the next complicated vector wave is the electromagnetic wave, right? EM waves. That's a part of the big leap from a Schrodinger equation, which is a scalar equation, which is uh, by no means easy to solve. You could, we got a model where electrons, so you are, they're actually no good tool to solve that right now. If you, even if you have two or three electrons, their mutual interaction becomes very difficult to solve. And that's a man-in-body problem. But say, uh, let's go to do EM waves. And for that, you have to go to Maxwell equations. right? And uh, uh, even you forgot it, but you heard about it. So let's uh, write, rewrite the Maxwell equations. And uh, uh, we have four equations, E cross H minus time derivative. Uh, e, uh, say uh, they cross E, and cross H is D dt plus the current. And uh, we have then the um, divergence of the displacement field 
equals the charge density, and the magnetic divergent magnetic induction is zero. And uh, uh, just uh, to review, this is a, uh, essentially what the first equation say: if you change the magnetic field, you have a general electric field. The second, if you pass a current through a coil, right, you generate magnetic field. And uh, this is uh, the Faraday law. This is uh, more like an Ampere's law, right? Some of the high school experiment. And Maxwell only add the one term, and he got all the credit. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, what do we have here? E is the electric field, right? The electric field uh, is the gradient of electrostatic potential. And so the unit is volt per meter, right? And uh, uh, um, uh, H is a magnetic field. And sometimes I don't remember the unit, so I go back to think of this. Current density I know, right? Current density is, here is m per meter square. So here is the, uh, say, times one meter, that gives me magnetic field is m per meter, right? So magnetic field is m per meter. And uh, D is the electrical displacement. Displacement. And uh, uh, what, it, what it means is uh, if you have a material, right, you have atoms, atoms as electrons, ions, right? If you have an electric uh, field that comes in, you know that they will get polarized, right? Positive charge has a force along the field direction, negative charge, opposite field direction, right? So that means they will have a dipole. So you'll have, in this case, you have more like a dipole. Here is a positive, here is a negative, OK? Right? So D is the uh, polarization per unit volume, dipole moment per unit volume. And uh, plus, the, if you have uh, original field comes in converted into the same unit, right? So that's a epsilon zero, that's a vacuum, plus uh, uh, the uh, polarization per unit, uh, the, the uh, dipole moment per unit volume. So dipole moment is uh, uh, the dipole uh, moment is the charge times meter, and per unit volume is a cubic, right? So the unit here is a coulomb per meter square, OK? And uh, from a coulomb per meter square, this is a coulomb per meter square, you find the epsilon 0. That's the vacuum uh, permi permittivity. I would say permeability, permittivity. Uh, permi uh, permittivity, epsilon zero is 8.8, .8, 10 to the minus 12, and uh, uh, here is a, should be coulomb epsilon here uh, is a farad per meter. Okay, so I have this one is a farad per meter. Okay, so. I have the, uh, this is a uh, D here, the dis displacement field. I said that this is the one uh, uh, external field create a dipole, right? In a real solid, it's not that simple because you have an atom here, you have another atom here, right? You have adjacent atoms. And not only the, uh, the uh, outside field, but also the lex labor, the dipole itself will affect uh, my si the atom itself. So it's actually a summation of all this effect. Okay, and uh, this one 
for this is a non-movable charge. This is the charge attached to the atom. Okay, that's dielectric, right? So you, uh, we sometimes write the epsilon, epsilon r, and uh, times e. Well, this combined together gives me another epsilon. That's a dielectric function of the material. It's not a constant. Sometimes we call dielectric constant. It's not a constant. It's a function of wavelength. It's a function of frequency. OK? So uh, that's the displacement. And similarly, magnetic induction B, you can write as a epsilon vacuum, uh, mu vacuum, mu r, and uh, times h. Right, this is just like we write into the displacement field, is the electric field times the dielectric constant. And here is the vacuum permittivity, the relative to vacuum. Most materials at a high wave, visible wavelength or high frequency, this one is about one. It doesn't have magnetic response, most materials. Right? At a low frequency, you have magnet. But say high frequency, most materials don't, uh, don't have the magnetic response. And in fact, that was the basis of an invention made by uh, Professor Marion Sojuse, right? He was trying to think about uh, how, to you, how do you get a powerless, wireless, coreless power transfer. And uh, uh, the problem is, if you want to beam a lot of power through this space, we will all be cooked. We have dielectric response, right? Microwave, you heat it up. But see, because materials at high frequency don't have magnetic response, so he thought about uh, using the magnetic field to deliver the power. So we have a startup trying to commercialize that. OK? So that's the uh, uh, basic equations. And a uh, uh, few more comments. The relation between current, that's the, when that's a real current, a free electron, the current flow, right? And current, of course, is related to electric field through the, if you have a conductor, a semiconductor, that's the Ohm's law. So uh, J equals electric conductivity, that's Ohm's law. Right? Electric conductivity is sigma. And uh, here the unit is uh, inverse ohm uh, uh, semen meter. Right? Uh, ohm centimeter. Yeah, inverse. No. Should be inverse. Or oh, say inverse ohm is also. Same m per meter, different units. If you don't use it often, it's very confusing. OK, so we have all these quantities. And uh, further, what is the uh, epsilon, uh, say, the charge density? All right? And this charge density is the lead charge per unit volume in the material. OK, so if you have a semiconductor, right? In a semiconductor, you can have a positive donor. Right? When, uh, uh, say, if you put a phosphor there. OK, so let's say put a phosphor atom in silicon, and phosphor atom loses the electron. So the atom itself is mobile. Electron becomes mobile, right? So what you need is uh, the, this is a positive charge. You also have an electron negative charge. You add them all together. That's per unit, uh, unit volume how much charge you have. So these are the uh, set of equations describing the, uh, max, the electromagnetic waves. And uh, uh, now we can say why. Uh, let's do a few math operation. Just get familiar with it. Right? Uh, you have seen them. So uh, if I look at this, I can eliminate. Uh, I will first eliminate, uh, because the B 
right here I can write as uh, mu h mu zero times mu r is mu and permittivity. And uh, so b equals mu h is I use the first one. I get uh, uh, um, the first equation delta cross e equals mass d mu h dt. That's the first equation. And the second equation, I have delta cross h equals uh, d dt and uh, epsilon times uh, uh, e. This is the dielectric function, which is epsilon 0 times epsilon r, right? The displacement field, and plus uh, sigma times e. Those are the, if I use considerable relations and uh, eliminate uh, uh, b and d, I got the equation here, right? And uh, let me first drop this term. Okay, let's consider uh, dielectric. There's no free charge in the material, so electric conductivity is zero. Okay, with that I can I can uh, plug this H into here, right? And I take a time derivative on both sides on both sides, and then I get a dH. So this is assuming mu and epsilon are independent of time, right? And if it depends on time, you have to be careful. It's not mine, right? Oh, OK. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I have the, uh, so if I, uh, eliminate, uh, uh, if I take this epsilon mu out, I'll be independent of time. And uh, sometimes you have to be careful because when you do those kind of mathematical operations, you make assumptions, you may lose big opportunities. Okay? And uh, 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 this electromagnetic field is. Uh, 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 there are a lot of new concepts that is all based on going back to the original equation and uh, uh, relook at them and say where are they, uh, say if you say under, the, the, where are the approximations made? Okay. You were reading Yablovich chapter, uh, say paper on photonic crystal, right? And uh, one of, say, uh, his photonic crystal is uh, really that uh, the concept that in that case, the epsilon, which we typically take a uniform, right? But uh, see, he was really taking this uniform epsilon as a periodic function. So he put the epsilon as a periodic function, and that's like a, a periodic potential for atoms, right? If you think about uh, when we solve the band gap of electrons, for Schrodinger equation that come from the fact that the potential for electrons is a periodic, right? The Maxwell equation itself, there's a, say uh, no potential here, right? It's really, he put this one epsilon as a constant, and he was really using the analogy. And uh, um, in fact, uh, say, uh, I, I spent, uh, one day I was, uh, in Berlin, we both of us uh, were uh, wandering in the city. So I was talking to him. He said that uh, when he conceived the concept of photonic crystal, uh, he, he wrote a paper. So photonic crystal, what is a photonic crystal is basically periodic arrangement of uh, whatever glass beads. You can think about that, right? And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, if you look at the, the evolution, uh, in electron, in ball crystal, we have band gap. And uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, there is this concept of uh, uh, super lattice, quantum wells. Right? You read, uh, again, Isake and two paper, and that's uh, putting multi layers of thin films. Right? That makes the one dimension, you got the artificial, this is what we draw the potential. Periodic potential, 
That's the chronic panning model we talked before, it's, but it's artificial material, right? So you go from a three-dimensional crystal periodic potential to 1D. And that's a big jump in concept because of artificial quantum structures, right? And uh, on the other hand, in optics, you have the form of the letter. Over 100 years, people know how to do coding. People have been doing refining optics to code multi-layer films, right? Some of this is a purely, say, anti-reflection or, or purely reflecting the purpose. And uh, so the reason, so you have those multi-layer thin film coatings, which is typically of the order of like quarter wavelengths. And you can code it so that it's a complete reflecting. What does complete reflection is the wave function of electromagnetic wave is zero inside. That's a forbidden. It's a band gap in 1D, right? So what uh, Yablovich proposed uh, for tiny crystal is how to make this back into 3D. What Leisure has uh, is electron phonons in 3D, and uh, cr uh, say uh, researchers we have created this 1D structure, right? So that's uh, you see is the opposite direction going. And here is trying to make photonic analogy of thin field to 3D. OK, so he said that when he wrote the paper, you go to read his paper, and uh, there's no math inside. Right? He was just a concept. And uh, uh, he submitted the paper, and uh, uh, he know who he wants to be a reviewer. And his friend said, do you really want to publish this paper? Uh, this is, a, this is a really uh, doesn't look like a paper. So it doesn't matter, just publish it. So that's what you read. Okay. It's, a, it's, the fun, it's the beginning of a new field, photonic crystal. Okay. Uh, so that's a epsilon is a function of R, periodic, right? And then your epsilon could also be a function of time. In fact, I was doing some, uh, uh, when I did my graduate school study, right? I never came up with big ideas, but the, uh, once I was writing down the loads, I said, OK, because I was doing some uh, uh, stuff during the optical, say, the fast laser material interaction. I say, during that process, the epsilon will change as a function of temperature, and temperature changes as a function of time. So I have to keep it that there. I wrote all those equations. And years, uh, say, a few years later, my friend asked me, I said, actually, it's in my notes. But uh, it never got anywhere. So, one story. But anyway, let's continue here. I have two equations. I drop this. I'm going to eliminate it. I say mu epsilon constant. And uh, I'm going to then put it out. And I can eliminate uh, h. And uh, what I have here then is the equation. Uh, so if I eliminate h, I have a delta cross e over mu. And uh, uh, here I have uh, uh, epsilon. I start to get a wave equation. OK? And uh, uh, you can use the vector operation to write, rewrite this into. If you use a vector uh, relation, you will get uh, uh, actually there is a negative sign in the front, and delta epsilon square mu uh, epsilon d e d t square, and uh, uh, if I continue carry that, you will be mu sigma d e d t. Okay, this is the one I carry the uh, uh, metal term, the conductivity term. If I don't, I have a pure wave equation. If I drop this, you can see this is a, a wave equation, second order in space, second order in time. Unlike the Schrodinger equation, 
which is a first order in time but has an imaginary number in the front. Now I have a real wave equation. It's a second order in both space and time. Right? So this is the uh, Maxwell equation. And uh, uh, if you look at the typical wave solution, plan wave, epsilon is a function of r and t. And uh, this is a vector, so that's the polarization direction, uh, the uh, electric field direction. And this is the propagation direction, omega t minus k dot r. So this is a plan wave, uh, plan wave expression we talked before. And you substitute back into here, you will say it satisfies the wave equation. Right? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, if you do it, if you substitute it back, see this left-hand side is uh, the second order derivative in space. So I'll get a k square. So I will get a k dot k, right? And the right-hand side, I will get a mu omega squared. This is time. And uh, uh, epsilon plus i sigma and uh, omega. This is the, this term combined with uh, the first term. And the rest, uh, i omega t, that this term cancel. The phase factor will cancel. OK? And uh, this way, I can write uh, uh, the expression as because of omega square, so I have mu epsilon tilde omega square. The wave vector is proportional to omega. For wave in free space, this is a epsilon zero mu zero free space, right? And this is what the triumph of electromagnetic wave because we predict. Maxwell equation predicted the uh, speed of light. Okay, because uh, when you do this, uh, you get uh, uh, the magnitude k square equals uh, omega divided by. Uh, here I do the square root of uh, uh, epsilon tilde mu and. Uh, this one, we can write it into So I can write it k, the magnitude. Uh, uh, oh, this is a not square, the magnitude. So the magnitude of k equals uh, uh, Omega times C, right? CK, omega equals CK, that's the dispersion. And C is square root of epsilon tilde and mu. And uh, typically, we define refractive index as the speed of light in vacuum divided by speed of light in the medium, right? And the speed of light in vacuum, this is epsilon zero mu zero, and uh, it's approximately because I say most uh, uh, high frequency uh, magnetic response is one. So this is a epsilon uh, tilt over epsilon zero, and this one is epsilon r. So even in, for metals, right, uh, very often we tabulate, we don't tabulate these two separately. We just tabulate them together into epsilon r, the relative dielectric constant. OK. So there are a few interesting stories here again. OK. You take a positive uh, square root of going from here to here. You take a square root, and you say that's a lateral solution. Right, and if you go to look at your uh, Maxwell equation, it turns out that this wave, it's a right-hand wave. So you go say this is epsilon uh, e direction, electric field direction. 
right? It's a transverse wave. You, this is the, what the equation tells you. Go, you check. Right? It's a transverse wave, so electric field will be perpendicular to magnetic field, will be perpendicular to k, the wave vector direction k, the wave propagation they write. That's why it's a transverse wave, right? It's not only transverse wave, it's also right-hand wave. What the right-hand mean is, if you recall, when you learn, let's uh, say, is E cross H goes to the wave propagation direction, right? So is the right-hand side, your E direction, you grab to the H direction, the thumb point to do the K direction, OK? So it's a, a right-hand wave, it's a transverse wave, except I say we ignore the possibility of uh, when you take a, uh, this K square root, it could be a negative also root solution. Right? Legacy solution uh, typically are ruled out, but if when epsilon and mu could be negative, right? When both of them could be negative, it turns out that you go back to check the equation again, you have to take a negative root. So this effect was predicted in 1950s by Russian scientist Versanago. And uh, 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 his paper was uh, uh, seen forgotten, OK? But in the 90s, people start to pay attention to it. First, there are natural, natural materials with Y negative. It just doesn't have natural material with mu equal negative. Why the natural material could have Y negative? Y, remember, is a response of the material, I think I erased it. When you have electric field, the material will polarize, right? If it's an electron, for example, and then when you have an external wave comes in, oscillating, the electron create a, a resisting, say, direction field. And if that field is larger than the incident, you get a negative res, uh, direction, displacement. So the Y become negative. But there's no material with mu in negative. Then, say, in 90, uh, say 90s, uh, people de de uh, designed this artificial resonator structure that create, uh, generate, uh, uh, say, artificial magnetic. So it's, you basically create a loop with a gap. And then when the electric current oscillate in this loop, they generate magnetic field. And we make it very small. The magnetic field could be very, very fast. Make it smaller, right? And uh, if you bring both y and mu negative in the same frequency range, you have to go to take that negative root. So it become a left-hand material. So E cross H, K goes the other way. So uh, this is a K go this way, but energy go this way. A lot of confusion at the beginning. Because uh, whether there is uh, this possible or not, uh, if you check the uh, literature, this is called metal material. Okay, it's not the metal materials, M A, not the M E. Okay, and uh, <laughs> it was an interesting story, many interesting stories. But some people say metal material. That's, so we, we study metals, but uh, it's, it's not a metal material. It's a meta. And they, uh, it's really artificially designed material, so it has strange properties. And one of the first achievements is design material in microwave range, so that uh, to prove that the refractive index really should be taking a negative value. So that's a really, later on you'll say, it's a pretty strange because when we think about optical light refraction, right? This is the refraction, Schnell law. We'll talk less to Schnell law, right? But when the n is negative, the refraction actually happened this way, and uh, it's pretty weird. So it's still a very active field, and you heard a Harry Potter story, the clocking, huh? Right? 
the, uh, so in that case, what happens is it could be solution of Maxwell equation. Comes in here, you have object. And you, this is actually will be easy for fluid mechanics. If you look at fluid mechanics, right? And then in small reload number flow, go this way, right? So what it means, the, the Maxwell solution like this means is even you have an object here, if you're away, you don't see far away, they, they, there's no scatter light, right? So what do you say, you, the light goes around, but say you look at it, it's just like the object doesn't exist. That's what they say, some of the strange effect of those matter materials, okay? And uh, I think, uh, say, I'll stop here, but uh, let's look at the, uh, now you can see a lot of interesting stuff. It's a lot longer. <laughs> so if you go to check, uh, say, this uh, at the beginning, there, there, there are a lot of paper, there are papers say there's no negative refraction. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, basically, uh, this is a, a little bit con uh, confusing because the energy is propagating forward and information is propagating backwards. Typically, people like to associate wave vector to information. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of uh, a debate in literature. But now I think the debate is all gone and uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, active. In fact, I, So uh, I just mentioned that epsilon could be negative. When epsilon negative, there is also, uh, it turns out that they, uh, again, all this is uh, we're going to talk more next lecture, uh, they, uh, there is a surface wave. We just said the evalescent wave is an exponential decay on one side, right? We just say the electron evalescent wave. You have photon evalescent wave. But say this, when epsilon is negative, you could have a surface wave that decays on both sides. Doesn't exist far away from the interface, so it's only uh, confined to the surface. And that's the surface plasmons so when these are the electron. So uh, let's say, let me just uh, do a few photon. Um, No, I'll go to this uh, image. Okay. So uh, though you can say that uh, this is a uh, um, really periodic structure in 3D or 2D. Originally, it's like films, as I said, <laughs> right? In fact, uh, I was at the UCLA, Yablo, which was UCLA. I remember once I turned the a uh, uh, student uh, thesis meeting, there was another professor just say, there's no Bra uh, photonic crystal, it's just a ref Bragg reflector. Bragg reflector is the 1D structure. People call Bragg reflector, right? Because 3D gives you a different name and uh, it suddenly opens up your imagination. And uh, you, so people start looking at a, a, a photonic semiconductor where you have a gap, right? And uh, you can dope your photon photonic crystal, and uh, uh, what does that mean, right? And uh, so you can say some of those uh, is uh, uh, you, you can guide the light in the structures and bending 90 degree, and you normally in optical fiber, you can't do that. And uh, you have to make a slow turn if you use optical fibers, but if you use this kind of structure, you can have more complicated. Uh, say uh, light path and uh, matter materials. 
right? And this was the first uh, uh, experiment where they use the split ring. In fact, it's a 2D. Uh, so they show that uh, uh, um, the, this kind of structure, and it could have, uh, say, a negative epsilon and negative mu at the same frequency range. And uh, uh, it was a pretty large structure. And they did a microwave experiment and show light can indeed go the wrong way. That's what the people say, light bend the wrong way, and normally against the intuition. And uh, after that, there are a lot of, uh, lot of structures, right? And let's look at the clocking. Huh. <laughs> well, this is not, people are not able to do that yet. Uh, it's a different, uh, different way of doing it. But that's the sort of what I was explaining, right? If your light doesn't get scattered into other directions, so essentially, if you're away from way of, uh, from if you're away from it, is you don't look at it, there's no reflection signal you can detect. Okay, and uh, so story is don't look, don't miss the details. Okay, some of the tiny effect, but it could be a big story. <laughs>